know you're eagerly anticipating this moment. And I want you to picture this. It is 6.30 p.m. on a Sunday afternoon. So you finish eating your rice and peas and chicken, right? Y yes. Yes. Your carrot juice. Yeah. And you turn to TVJ. And you snuggle into your softest seat. And you are ready to hear the magnificent stories based on themes in literature that speak to the human condition, the vicissitudes of life, the triumph of the human spirit. You sigh, a reluctant tear falls sometimes. And if you're alone, you bawl your eyes out because sometimes you see your very life unraveling in front of you through someone else's story. Picture this, it's 9.30 p.m. on TVJ. It's Tuesday night, religious hard talk, thought-provoking, controversial, or as some would say, I wouldn't get the mad people there. What do these programs have in common? Of course, the distinguished, talented, and respected journalist, Mr. Ian Boyne. On any Sunday morning, I await the Sunday Gleaner because I'm not going online. I want the pages to turn with my breakfast. Please, Mr. Boyne, tell the Gleaner to get better quality paper because that one dirty up my hand. All right. His column is a must read. And then I jump to another writer who is not too old for name calling. Ian Boyne is a veteran journalist who is deputy CEO of the Jamaica Information Service, Chief State Liaison, who serves the Office of the Prime Minister, the Office of the Leader of the Opposition, and the Office of the Governor General. He's also the host of the popular TV program I just spoke to, Profile, the longest running non-seasonal show on Jamaican television, now in its 30th year. He's also the longest serving columnist with the Gleaner Company, writing for the Sunday Gleaner for 33 years. In addition, he is a host of the television program, Religious Hard Talk, and the flagship television program, Issues and Answers. Mr. Boyne's first stint with the JIS, then known as the Agency for Public Information, was in 1976. I was still in high school. Between 1976 and 1983, he was a feature writer and television broadcaster with the agency. He joined the staff of JAMPRO, the State Investment Promotions Agency, in 1988 as speech writer and communications consultant, a position he held until 2002 when he joined the JIS. Mr. Boyne is a recipient of 10 journalism awards for excellence in both print and television including five awards for his column writing, the highest number gained by any living columnist. In 2009, Jamaica honored him by awarding him the Commander of the Order of Distinction. Mr. Boyne is the author of the book, Ideas Matter, and co-author of Profile of Excellence. Chairperson of the Committee of Management, Mrs. Patricia Sinclair McCallow, Principal Mr. Finmer McCarthy, Ladies and gentlemen, I present the speaker for the 2017 Ted Dwyer Lecture, Mr. Ian Boyne. Thank you very much. Madam Chairperson, distinguished guests on the platform, uh, teachers, members of staff, students, media colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. May I first of all uh, thank you for that enthusiastic welcome. I, I don't know whether that was staged, but whether or not it is, it is appreciated. Um, I'm indeed honored that it could be thought that I would have something of value to impart this afternoon. 
Ted Dwyer was a man of distinction, a Renaissance, Renaissance man, as our chair quite aptly called him. And I think that it is a signal honor to be able to speak in his, in his memory and to his, his statue. So I'm very delighted that this opportunity has been presented uh, to me. And when I note that I follow in the footsteps of two former education ministers as lecturers in this um, series, I feel even more delighted. Ted, I knew you was one of the persons, one of the distinguished guests on uh, profile. And Ted was truly an ideas person. And I think that the theme that I have chosen for this presentation would be one that he would feel was quite appropriate, one that would be very close to his heart. And I'm sure that some of the points that I would make, had he been alive, he himself would be making them in various fora, including in the media. Because he was very passionate about Jamaica. He was a resolute nationalist. And he was someone who believed that our culture could provide the sources of strength to drive our economic development. And I think he would be at one with me in putting forward the view that it is myopic to think that one can build an economy on an infrastructure of values and attitudes which are counterproductive. I quote from the Gleaner editorial of last Thursday, titled Towards Education Based on Values. I quote, there's a startling statistic about what happens when a teacher enters a Jamaican classroom for say a 40 minute session with students. On average, he or she spends up to 16 minutes attempting to establish order, maintain silence, enforce discipline, or attend to personal and administrative concerns. That's 40% of the lesson time. Compare that to Singapore, where effective teaching and learning actually take place in 90% of the class time. It should be no surprise that outcomes suffer in Jamaican schools and frustration levels among teachers and students are very high. So we hear in some circles that Jamaica should be like Singapore. We speak adoringly of the remarkable economic transformation of Singapore, a very small island, very small state, and a country that we were ahead of when we gained our independence in 1962. In fact, the former Premier Lee Kuan Yew looked to Jamaica as an example of a third world country that was doing well. Yet today, Singapore is a part of the prestigious Rich Man's Club of the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, as the, the wealthiest countries in the world are in that grouping. This is a small third world country without the kinds of natural resources that we have. But using its culture and its ingenuity, Singapore has managed to build an economy that has been dubbed one of the 
miracle economies of the world. And I hold the view that our values and attitudes are central to any meaningful quest for economic development. So the government is on a thrust for prosperity. Prosperity is the mantra of the government, and that is certainly a laudable goal. But prosperity has to be anchored in something deeper because it is the quest for prosperity that drives a lot of scammers. A lot of scammers believe in prosperity. The let lot of scammers believe in gaining wealth. It is just that they do not subscribe to the values of mainstream society that one should do this through honest effort and through hard work. A lot of scammers believe that if they can achieve their prosperity and their wealth and be able to wash their cars with champagne, if they can do that through cunning some white people, then nothing is wrong with that because they don't share our values that people should be going to school studying for how many years and can buy a car sometimes even struggling to pay the bus fares they feel as madness they look on some teachers and they say but these teachers are not able to live in certain palatial circumstances the teachers who taught them have to now stand up at the bus stop and watch them uh, driving posh cars. And so they're in, their, in their value system because money is at the apex of their value system. And getting ahead is at the apex. And because people are in a his to make money, they have no qualms about what they're doing. So we have too large a number of persons involved in lot of scamming, pushing up our murder rate, which sends all the wrong signals to would-be investors which would scare away people of talent who would want to stay in Jamaica and work in Jamaica. Because of this group of persons who don't share a particular set of values that mainstream society uh, shares, but who believe in getting ahead and in, and in prosperity, we have the kind of social maladies that we have so i suggest that the quest for economic growth which the two political parties are commendably committed to the quest to raise the standard of living of the jamaican people because there is no way in which we will deal with the poverty and the social degradation if the economy does not grow, there is no virtue in poverty. And there is no virtue in economic stagnation. So the present government's thrust toward prosperity is a laudable one. And the commitment of the two political parties to macroeconomic stability, which is the foundation of economic growth, is good. But I suggest that the parties will have to take on some deeper things. The, party for, the parties, for example, the political parties and the political class will have to say to our teachers, if they have lucrative opportunities to go to North America or to go through the 
the Gulf states, to go to Dubai, to go to other parts of the world where there are stronger economic incentives. Why should our teachers stay? What would make our teachers want to stay and deal with the kinds of problems that they have to deal with in the classroom if they can seek their prosperity abroad? What would make our nurses want to stay when the nurses are in such demand abroad? So the state has to be thinking of, you know, um, putting in some steps to halt the kind of aggressive poaching which is taking place. So here you have two categories of, of persons performing very important tasks in the country, the teachers and nurses. When they think about what the US dollars that they can earn abroad can do, the kind of houses that they, those dollars can pay down on and the cars they can bring. Why would they be thinking of staying in Jamaica to struggle with you students when they can achieve their prosperity so much more easily? So the prosperity mantra are the, the broad economic goals of the, of the two main political parties who are talking about aggregate economic goals. Those goals are not enough to inspire people to struggle to achieve those goals here. A recent statistic showed a high proportion of our young people who would love to live abroad. And if I were to take out a survey in this room, and you were to be honest with me, if I told you for sure where I could give you a US visa, you could get a US visa easily. And you could go abroad, and we could guarantee that you would get scholarship while abroad. I don't know how many persons would have their hands down to say they wouldn't want to leave. Because what is there and what has the political class given you? What reasons to stay? When there are better opportunities, there are better opportunities in advanced countries. And what is it about your leaders? What is it they are saying that make you excited about staying in Jamaica, contributing to Jamaica? Especially because the IMF program that the two parties are committed to. The two parties are locked into it. The program that the Prime Minister is following, IMF program, was the same one that the former Prime Minister left. Both of them are following the prescriptions of the International Monetary Fund, and both of them boast how many tests they pass from our international masters so there's no disagreement between them and those who understand some of the imperatives of economic growth will see that there are really few options so they are not being irresponsible to follow the program of the international monetary fund because without that we wouldn't have the funds to be able to keep the electricity on and to provide the amenities that we need and to have some basic goods in the supermarkets. So we can't rationally be talking about a non-IMF part now, so I'm not knocking them for that. But what I'm saying is that this part calls for austerity. Before we reach the prosperity, it calls for austerity. Tighten up your belt. And how many people you feel that the belt can't tighten any further? And remember now, because of the penetration, it's not just that we know people who go to America. We know with our, our smartphones, we are exposed to the lifestyle of the rich and the famous. We are in a haste to get our bling now. 
We're not in this poverty thing. We want the bling clothes. We want the bling fashion. The bling cars, all these things. So at the same time that we're exposed, and you know, the chairman was very kind to me. Talking about, well, 6.30, all people are looking to watch TV. That was when JBC was the only station you could have watched. Yeah, my laugh. I'm like, not away. You never have no choice. And your mother forced you before Martin in it. Go watch profile. But it's the unusual person, young person. I still have a very high audience. But I'm competing with Netflix. I'm competing with, with, with Twitter. I'm competing with Facebook. I'm competing with so many things. And I don't know well I'm, I, I'm doing in a competition. So while, you know, some people say, boy, you bring on some inspiring people come from the inner city and they do so well and all that. And the young people should be watching that. The young people are following up with Rihanna and Justin Bieber and all of that. And the kinds of values that they are projecting and the lifestyle that they are projecting. Our oh, austerity program can't accommodate that. So the political leaders have a problem. So while they continue to, to talk big words in parliament and other places, there, there are some problems that they are not addressing. The two parties. They were collapsing, collapsing social infrastructure. Well, now we're talking a lot about sexual abuse of young girls, which at least that's a big part of the discussion. And some cases in the media of carnal abuse have um, affected the discussion in social media. But that issue again comes back to the values. Because some young girls who want to get ahead, want certain types of year style, want certain type of clothes, they find some big man like me, you know, <laughs> who in a position, worse if they look too bad like all we. Drive a nice car and, you know, can dress up and all that kind of thing. And if me can send on some good money, the young girls will, will deal quite consensually. So, so the problem, the problem, and then sometimes you have even the adults, the adults encouraging the family members and the girls and say, boy, deal with this man because it better you deal with him. I don't look at what is boy in the better you deal with that a decent man. Because if you don't deal with a decent man, you're going to deal with a worthless boy them anyway. Somebody as well deal with a man who have ambition and who can help you and him guide you and so on. He really you know, exploiting you sexually. But at least you're getting something out of that relationship. You're the one who just uh, use you and you're not getting nothing. Well, you can't get fed to an election, though, with Patway. You know, so I have to honor him. So what will keep the young girl from bowing? What will keep her? <laughs> I don't mean that in the, in the Jamaican sense. Not in the Jamaican sense. I'm aware of the various uses. I mean, let me use that bigger. Capitulating there. Capitulating. Giving in. Giving in. What? When there is poverty, the only thing that would affect, the only thing that would keep that young girl or have the mother suffering and saying, we're still not going to give in to this man because he's having money. It would have to be some values. It would have to be some ideas of them heads say, uh, why this is not right? So there would have to be some notion of what is right. So the country has a very serious problem because, because of the early sexual initiation I see even the recently appointed president of the PNP, Peter Phillips, in his acceptance speech on Sunday, made reference to this. Said, you know, two out of ten mothers um, are teenagers. I'm saying that you have to deal with 
the breakdown of family life. I was happy that at a political rally, he could put that there as an important issue. To say we have to deal with that. And he made the connection between that and poverty. And when you look at the damage that is done to our girls because of the early sexual initiation, the lack of trust, because some of these people who are initiated, girls are pastors and unfortunately teachers and guidance counselors and all. Don't run me out of the place and all that, you know. But these are the facts. There are people who should be protecting these girls. So even though they're taking the money, they, they really realize there's something wrong. And they, they, so that there is this lack of trust. And that is only deep in the problem that we have in our culture. Because a big part of the problem that we have, our social deficit problem, is low levels of trust. Low, low levels of trust. And that kind of exploitation deepens that. So when these girls grow up, they are less trusting of people with institutional power. So we have a very serious problem. I say that the values and attitudes issue represents this elephant in the room that, that we are not addressing, but it's crucial. And former, former Prime Minister P.J. Patterson was prescient and insightful when he launched the Values and Attitudes program in the early 1990s. And he was right to recognize that if we were to be talking about national development, we would have to give people a vision about Jamaica, have them buy into that vision and buy into a certain set of values. So what we're having right now is the attempt to build economic growth. On a very shaky foundation. So you have large numbers of your people in unstable relationships. Not just that we have a high percent of a common law relationship, but they are unstable. And most of them are visiting relationships. It's not even common law that where the man and woman live together. It's really just, you know, since where Uncle, Uncle John are coming tonight and three more nights, Uncle Paul are coming in and all these different men are passing through the place. So you must have you must have the carnal abuse thing because after that time you now the girls him grew up and Uncle John feel that him have a right not only to the mother but also to the daughter and so on. And the girls are seeing that instability in the relationship. And young men in our culture that glorifies sexual promiscuity. And the dance hall, the dance hall that big up Gallus. Because the dance hall has a greater influence than the school. Dance hall has a greater influence than church. Dance hall has a greater influence than traditional media. So as the other day, I, I, I was listening to a YouTube, um, to a YouTube offering by one of the defenders of dance hall. It was laced with open expletives, but because I have to understand where I go on in the culture, I have to, you know, bear that. I was saying, what, re referring to Lisa Anna's statement about cartel. The world boss to many people. Don't know how many world boss supporters are here, but they have to hide it anyway. Because teachers and so on are here. And the guy was saying, you know, you know, you, you know Lisa, you don't know where I'm going. We know, if you ban the boss, music on radio, I mean, can we not listen to radio? We don't listen to radio. So the media, that's true. The media, even if you were to, to ban certain types of music, people have them phone. People have access to all the things that are affecting our values. And you have the dance hall all the way, you have the sound system all over the place. Still on buses and all of that. So... With the influence of the dance hall as a main source of socialization. Telling young boys that because if, if you reach a certain age and you don't have a number of women, and if you all even don't get anybody pregnant, they start wondering if you are gay, wondering if something wrong with you. So when you face that kind of pressure, with the, with the, with, with the result, 
that a lot of girls get pregnant and the fathers are absent. Now that, kind, that phenomenon of the absent fathers creates serious psychological problems. And a lot of our murderers, if you talk to those guys, fatherlessness is a major feature. They have never had a father. And today I was interviewing someone who works a lot in inner cities, in Spanish town, East, Mont uh, St. James. And he was saying, when you talk to the, these youth, and you mention father, I mean, it's like a bad word. They do have any good thing to say about father, because many of them, the fathers are absent. So I'm telling you the kind of society we have and the people we have, that the two political parties are talking about economic growth. They are committed to that. President government talking about five in and four. Well, five in four, the girls them damage, the boys them damage, you the guys them talking about how much you them get. So you have no sense of responsibility. So you have your large numbers, people in uh, growing up in single-aided households. Um, Dr. Sam Vaughan had given a Grace Kennedy Foundation lecture. Uh, in 2006, where you know, children caught in the crossfire, and she talks about the kinds of, of maladies which afflict uh, children who are not in stable um, homes. Um, Jamaican children who live in less stable common law and visiting unions, those in single parent homes are homes with a biological and surrogate parent are more withdrawn in their interactions with others, have more delinquent behaviors, are more aggressive. When you see the number of, of maladies that Dr. Sams Vaughan mentions here in homes that constitute the majority of, of our homes, then you see the problems that the country faces in terms of trying to build economic growth. So this problem of our, of our values was captured early 1992. The great political scientist, Professor Carl Stone, he did an important paper titled Values, Norms, and Personality Development in Jamaica. Now, it won't be too long, but this is a lecture, so it can't be too short either. <laughs> I have to do justice. Now, Ted Wise, a man who didn't, you know, it's ipsy bits. He believes that we must, we must be thorough. So I'm not going to keep you too late, but I have to do justice to his name. And he was a man who was highly read and he was very scholarly. So I can't just come here and talk about the top of my head, because I'm talking to serious students. And people like you would take off time on a champs evening. I mean, I didn't expect I'd come and say, well, you know, I'll get, I'll get a few people here. But that the whole place would be packed. Unless some dire sanctions were threatened if people were not here. <laughs> Probably some dire sanctions, but you are unusual to be here to be listening to some, some boring lecture. Well, carrot and stick have to be applied. So if stick, if stick is more effective than the carrot. So, so pardon me, because we're also, we're taping for media. So, I don't want to be flippant with the, with the presentation. So, Stone. Stone in 1992. You students who are, who are taking um, notes. In a, in a paper in March 1992. March 1992. That's about, what, 35 years ago. Values, norms, and personality development. This is what Stone said. Stone says, rampant individualism has replaced and weakened the strong family bonds and community ties of the past, therefore weakening the traditional mechanisms of social control. Rampant individualism. Every man thinking about himself. Every man thinking about, listen to what he, he, he said further. Quote, the dominance of money as the single most important currency of influence, power, and status and the decline of respectability as a status-defining factor have promoted increased and rampant corruption both in the government and the private sector, corporate world. The dominance of money is the most important thing. Nowadays, 
respectable people who um, give a lot of voluntary service and work with community group and youth group and teach extra class and things there. A man checks if, if, if you have a flag down, look at tax, robot taxi after that. You are really nobody eh, and stand up a bus stop. But if you flash down now in a, in a BMW or so on or in a X6 and so on. People feel that you are respectability has been transferred to consumers, not producers. It's not the man who work hard, you know. We don't promote and big up people who work hard. In fact, we laugh at them and say them are idiot. And my Ali Button, I work hard for nothing. We big up the people who have things, who can show things. Not the man who work hard. We man can show things. It doesn't matter where it comes from. So Stone recognized that from 92, the dominance of money as the single most important currency of influence. That's why Jamaica has a problem with corruption. It's no particular party. Corruption is not confined to any particular party. And the parties use various mechanisms. So yes, I believe that mechanisms can help. Laws can help. But what is even more important are human beings. If you have human beings who are moral, who have an ethical worldview, and we're not trying to use all kinds of bandula ways, because Jamaicans are very creative. We'll use all sort of ingenious ways to go around your system. We will get around any system. Because we can be creatively criminal. Why? Because the dominance of money. So whether you're talking about paying off police or paying to get certain kinds of services in government, you have a problem with that. So we had we, we achieved a number of things, a number of the economic indices went in the right direction in the last year. But we went down in the Transparency International Corruption Index. It's not surprising if you look at the theme that I've been talking about. That you have a dilapidated social infrastructure. You need to fix the people. You can't just be talking about fixing the economy. You have to fix the people. The dominance of money. The profound changes in values, norms, and modes of behavior. Stone identified 1992. The 93 Dr. Lucian Drones gave the Grace Kennedy Foundation lecture. He said in that lecture, the minds of those who have been held captive by the philosophy of materialism must be transformed. They see their salvation in the elevation of their status, money, increasing positions, power over others, and the ability to indulge in whatever their appetites demand. Falling prey to selfishness, they use their talents only for the advancement of self rather than for the good of the country. That's why when, when National Heroes Day comes along, our independence and liberty, and I write, still write for the I write for various prime ministers, so I, I do their... Um, I do their, their messages. And when I used to work on it, my former PS, um, uh, Pat uh, McCullough on the boat, Mr. Golden, and then um, later Prime Minister um, Portia Simpson Miller. Both, uh, we, we served both administrations. So I would write, I still write the messages. As I'm writing, for these various prime ministers. I know what I'm writing about, you know, sacrifice and Paul Bogle did this and now man, man. Yeah, you know, connect with it. Speaking the language about sacrifice and giving up things. It's the language, I mean, I mean, Labor Day people gonna beach and all. National Heroes Day people gonna beach and party and whole pass people are swinging. Why not pay attention? Oh, Garvey and all the people. Out of sync, so all this notion about sacrifice. So the politicians, you know, the politicians have to now come back to the matter of sacrifice and, you know, doing good for the country and um, not just being selfish. But they're preaching all of that. But it's empty because the people are looking for prosperity and economic growth and things for themselves. When you're preaching now, are you coming out with about sacrifice and living for others? That message is out of sync with how people are living on a day-to-day -day basis. Every man for himself. Every man wants to have a blink. And you have a the dance hall. 
the dance hall reinforces this I'll soon be finished. The dance hall shames people who are poor. You listen to the dance hall music, you know. If you don't have anything, you know, people cuss you in the dance hall, you know. Woman and man, of course, you don't have this, you don't have that. And then you have the hip hop influence. They hating, but they broke though. Ah, we never know something, all them things there. We never know. Give me a forward for that. Oh, whoa. They hating, but they broke. So, like you broke, you're nobody. If you in Macro them, of course, people are like, what they not have. These things affect the poor, affect the working class. So, we live in a society that denies so many of our people the goods. And we doubly victimize them. Our dance hall reinforcing. So when traditionally I have not the dance hall. And the people of our university disagree with me. They don't understand the perspective. But Ted, I would understand the kind of perspective that I would bring in my critique of the dance hall. The dance hall reinforces some negative values. The dance hall that tell if a man this year, you must deal with him. That promotes criminality and it's not just as some people say well dance only i reflect what is here no a man will tell you say your marrow must fly if you, it's not just that he's reflecting he's telling you what to do with a boy who this so the dance hall rather than telling us how we used to grow up on some things we say boy he who fights and run away will live to fight and man not tell boy dance hall not tell about no fight and run away in fact, there's a certain word, me can't use this, I want to know it. They would have called you that if you're about to, have, about to run away. You have to face the music and deal with that boy. The dance hall reinforces the captivity of poor people by promoting bling. If we could turn around the dance hall, where the dance hall artists now are big enough, the teachers who are helping the youth. Bigging up the nurses who could have go away, but they are staying here to help people. Bigging up the student from the inner city who is, who is learning, who is studying his book. If, if that could be, if those messages can be reinforced in the dance, I'll be good. The dance I used to promote big man I deal with young girl. I might say young girl business that control Jamaica and all them kind of thing that. And you need to have, I say alkaline the other night, them new rules. When alkaline come on, and I was, I was watching him, him come on and start bonfire upon rapists. My call for them to kill, I don't agree with, with, with that. But the power of an alkaline, in other words, if the dance all shames certain kinds of activities, and come out against certain kind of activities, you would start to see some change in the culture. Because rapists, you know, if rapists all go to jail, all kind of things happen to them. So you need people who are involved in a domestic violence, who beat up women, you have to put them in the same category of rapists. So you burn fire upon them. People who don't believe in honesty, if you could use the dance hall, to reinforce some of these positive values, then the political parties could be helped. And so I'm, I'm putting forward the, the view this evening that the, the, the discourse in the country needs to involve more discussion about values and attitudes. I want to commend you students, and this is one of the benefits of the internet age, is you can go online and you can be exposed to just phenomenal resources. If you go to the Grace Kennedy Foundation website, and I urge you to go and look at the 1998 lecture that was given by Professor Don Robottom, Vision and Voluntarism. A number of them are good, but that one in particular. If you want a lecture that captures the crisis of the country in terms of values, that lecture does it. In that, Professor Robottom says, 
there is no common vision which strongly unites a wide cross-section of the people of what it means to be Jamaican. The only thing that really unites Jamaica is sports. And that's when we are winning. Okay? We are losing. We're not in because we're not even losers. There's nothing that we have in common. Religion divides politics. There's nothing. We have uptown, downtown, brown man, you know. So the country needs a unifying vision. The fundamental issue, Robotham says, is how do we strengthen the moral bonds of the Jamaican society? How do we give real meaning to the concept of Jamaica? How do we establish this positive vision of Jamaica, which once existed, but which has clearly been found wanting? The economic goals presuppose that the moral goals have been articulated and have taken root. And I say to the government that it has to find the means. I know the Prime Minister doesn't want to be seen as a preacher. But the political leaders have to find the means of articulating a vision for the people beyond just personal interests to address whether you're talking about the issue of the indiscipline of the road on the roads which resulted in 3,933 crashes and the Prime Minister pointed out in his budget speech last week that 55% of the persons who died in the crashes are in their most productive years 15 to 44 that's a loss to the, to, the, to, the, to the GDP. When you consider how much the, the, the health services are already strained. And a lot of the health services are further strained because of the trauma cases. We are stab up so much people and we are shoot so much people and we are killing off ourselves and others on the roads. That issue, the issue of uh, the high violence, high corruption, Domestic abuse of, 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 of women, gender imbalance, all of these social issues which impact on economic development. Because if you study the Far East, study Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan, China, you will see where culture has played a major part in their development. Japan, culture has played a major part. And therefore, I suggest in this lecture that the issue of values and attitudes is the elephant in the room. That we ignore this issue to our peril. That we are overdue for a front and center discussion about what type of society we are building. It has to go beyond the economics in order for us to energize the youth we have to develop some countervailing values against the values that are purveyed this phone these mobile devices that have captured our our youth people who control information control control our desires control our tastes control our feelings how do we regain the interest? How do we have people committed to Jamaica? Ted Dwyer was nothing if he was not a passionate nationalist who believed in Jamaica. He believed in Jamaica. He believed in the development of Jamaica. If we were alive today, you'd be a deeply troubled man. I think that the best we can do in his honor, those of us in our own small way, if we can try to recapture the values, because we did have it in the 40s, those are 40s and 50s, a tremendous surge of voluntarism, strong sense of a national movement. In the 1960s, young people were not always like this. Young people were thinking about building a new Jamaica in the 60s. Young people were studying radical ideas of black power and talking about Africa. Which Africa young people talking about now? They talk about America, they talk about bling, they talk about get ahead. In the 70s, there was also that kind of spirit. 
There were people doing voluntary work all over the place, working in youth clubs, working in community groups. There were people who believed in a, in a struggle, who believed that life was not just about what they acquired. I don't like to talk about getting back to those days, but in order for us to forward into prosperity, we need to forward with certain values and attitudes. That is my contribution. I thank you. Can we get a forward on that? Yes. And Mr. Boyne, I'm glad you mentioned that book, Vision and Volunteerism, because it's a recommended reading for our students in the social outreach program. Yes, and our students have to do 30 hours of community service right, in our programs here, all right, and, and you, you didn't think Mr. Boy knew anything about alkaline, right, it's all about the money, yes, all right, yeah, and the vibes, don't all of me everything, yes, all right, um, at this point, we'll call the president of our students' union, Mr. Donovan Stewart, to do thank you. Mr. Ian Bowen. Uh, hold on. Guest speaker, Mr. Ian Bowen. Principal, Mr. Fillmore McCarthy, other distinguished guests. Members of staff, students, families, and friends, good evening. It is indeed an honor to have you here today to share in such rich memoir of Mr. Thomas Ted Dwyer. We will take with us this knowledge that you have bestowed upon us throughout our daily lives and hope that in doing this, We'll be, we will be effective in carrying out the vision of Mr. Ted Dwyer. Again, we thank you, Mr. Ian Boyne, for sharing such words to us. Thank you.